Good afternoon. It's that time of week again. Yes, you've got it. It's Data Matters brought to you by Privacy Culture. I'm Steve Wright, a partner here at Privacy Culture, and I'm delighted to introduce a fantastic lineup we have today. And we're here today to talk about data privacy in the digital surveillance age, something that troubles me and has done for many, many years. So today we've got three great guests for you. Let me just give you a little bit about uh, a background to this, a little bit of context, and then I'll introduce you to our th three guests. Um, surveillance takes many guises. It, it works both covertly and overtly. There are many different examples that we see in the news every day. Most recently, we've been debating uh, inbuilt surveillance and various different COVID apps around the world. But there is actually a more darker, sinister side to surveillance that takes place all around us. Facial recognition software harnessed in the prevalence of CCTV, and the UK is the most CCTV country in the world, so I'm told, uh, means that we're all scanned and visually recognised on a daily basis. Now, clearly that's not happening a lot because we're all locked in our homes. <laughs> Uh, under different different rules around the world but usually when we're out there in the pubs clubs or if just walking down the street we're picked up daily by different cctv cameras extension now this is generally for crime prevention and for detection of terrorism but the software uh, has proven to be fallible and it can also show um, a sort of racial bias potentially leading to miscarriages of justice. So are we blindly heading towards this dystopian nightmare, I hear you say? Now, GDPR um, lawfully requires under, certainly under Articles 25, Privacy by Design, Articles 35, requires organisations to conduct a data protection impact assessment to ensure those fundamental freedoms and rights that we've all we come to expect now are taken into consideration and are not compromised. Um, you could argue that digital surveillance is crucial to our society, to advances in our society. However, these issues have to be balanced and the privacy aspects need to be designed and considered when we're collecting all this vast data using these software and applications. So in an age of digital surveillance, COVID testing, facial recognition can and should privacy be considered and to answer these and many more questions we've got lined up and don't forget please audience this is all about you guys give us your questions start them coming through and we'll start filtering those questions um, as soon as you want um, we've got three three guests three wonderful speakers today um first of all and forgive me joanna if i mispronounce your surname here i should have practiced this before um <laughs> Joanna Mokazadlo. It's Mochadlo. Oh, Mochadlo. I apologise. <laughs> it sounds more Italian, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> jo Joanna is a lawyer with practical experience of working in data protection and privacy. She's a very keen uh, privacy enthusiast, a bit like most of us tuned in today. Um, she loves the world of privacy and, and everything in uh, all about it. So she's here to talk to us. She's works at Redbridge um, Borough Council, uh, a council just on Greater London. Um, so welcome today, Joanna. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Steve. I'm very pleased to be here and thanks. Yeah. I'm delighted. Sorry, I didn't <laughs> um, No, it's wonderful. Um, thank you for taking the time. Uh, we also have our next guest is Rainer Keisler. He's a, what I called him a techie, uh, because he just babooed me with techie stuff. And um, when I tell you what he does for a living, you'll see why. He is the CEO of Swiss Tech, which is a laser machine engineering company based in Zurich. Uh, he has MBAs, he's LLM, he's a software engineer, and he was also the former uh, emerging tech partner at PwC, as well as the global cyber security chief at UBS. Um, welcome, Rainer. Thank you. Pleased to be here. And then finally, um, our last expert is Yuta Uberlin. Um, she's an uh, ex-PwC Deloitte Privacy Specialist working with global organisations 
and has recently joined the Google privacy team. But she also worked for the Cantonal Swiss Data Protection Authority and um, is uh, the IAPP's Young Privacy Professional Lead for Switzerland. Welcome, Yuta. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for having us. Oh, well, it's, I, I, I mean, I'm spoiled. Um, so I've got this first question. I think I think I'm going to I'm going to post this one to you, Raina. So on, on your guard. OK, um, so what you know, let, let, let's unpack this a little bit for, for our audience. What what is facial recognition? How does it work? What are the success to, uh, factors you know, needed to make it accurate? Um, so yeah, can you tell us from a sort of technology perspective, just to give us this uh, picture? Yeah, absolutely. So when I answer this question, I'm I'm focusing on the on the mostly or the most widespread technology. I mean, there are different technologies that, that mm -hmm. enable such a function, but uh, mainly uh, we are talking here about the combination of a camera. Uh, and of uh, uh, machine learning capabilities. And I think we have uh, experienced uh, a huge step forward in this technology in the recent years because miniaturization and uh, specifically edge computing has, has made a big, big uh, uh, development. Uh, when I say edge computing, I mean that we have more and more uh, electronic intelligence in smaller and smaller uh, uh, devices. So you can have a, a camera that can uh, provide a, fa a facial recognition functionality, even if not connected to uh, a backend. And uh, what it's all about is it's a camera uh, shooting uh, images of, of faces with very different lights, with, with very different, in very different situations, and usually sends these pictures back to a processor that uh, just um, is an enhanced statistics analyzing the picture and comparing it with uh, model pictures from earlier shoots. And uh, what uh, the, the technology makes uh, so unique is that uh, there is a very, very high error tolerance. So in, in earlier versions of this technology, you needed to have a very good picture, very good light, mm -hmm. uh, the person always in the, in the same kind of mood. And uh, the, the technology has evolved now, being able to even recognize you when you have uh, glasses on one day, no glasses on another day, because uh, the software is, is not only more capable from a machine learning perspective, but it's as well becoming more and more uh, uh, fast, so faster and faster. What this means is uh, the comparison process can uh, go on uh, in almost real time. So I can I can make a picture, even a moving picture of a person, and in almost real time, I can compare it with a database and find out who it is. Wow. Okay. Well, that, now I'm sufficiently scared. <laughs> Thank you for that. And um, you know, just for our listeners, if, if your case you're wondering what's in the background of Rainer's uh, backdrop there, it's just the odd laser machine that you have lying around in your garage. Um, so look, moving on to my next question. Okay, uh, this this one I think really is for you, Utah. Um, given the privacy risks, right, um, involved with any data collection and, and, and look, the comparisons in real time that, that, that Rainer was just mentioning there, oh my word, it's a bit frightening, right? Um, I mean, we're collecting vast waves of biometric data, other sensitive personal data, you know, and, and all via these combined facial recognition apps or whether that's CCTV plus COVID apps, you know, with that medical um, information. What should we be thinking about um, as DPOs when it comes to these use of technologies? 
Um, Steve, as you already said in the introduction, it's all about to ensure the rights and freedoms of the, of the data subjects. And so this means we need to evaluate the specific risk, especially when we're talking about the special categories of data. You can find those special categories of data and the legal definition in Article 9 of the GDPR. And um, so it means like, but also if you're not processing special categories of data, but but in specific when you are processing those data, you always need to evaluate the risk for the data subject. So that means you need to work with a privacy by design approach. Okay. Also with a data protection impact assessment. So that means data protection by design means, for example, if you are working on a technology like Rainer mentioned, so even before you implement it or design this technology, um, work on the privacy aspect of it. So the privacy aspect should be built in. And with the privacy aspect, I mean the principles of the GDPR, like lawful processing, fairness, and on data minimization. And this should be implemented and also the other requirements of the of the GDPR should be implemented already in the design phase of this technology. This is quite difficult. I, I saw it in my past when working in consulting. We, we had quite some technologies we had a look at and sometimes it's really difficult first to determine how does it look like because especially face, facial recognition is quite complex. So I think in the designing phase, so in the beginning, like years back when they started to, to design this technology, they were not aware what they can do like 10, 15 years later, or even what mm. we see in 20 years. And so it's all about the first, so evaluate for a first time, so before you design, and then, but continue with privacy impact assessments. So two years later, if you change something, or even if you can, like in the beginning, there were a lot of mistakes, especially, um, remember when when Facebook started with this facial recognition sometimes so so at least I was tagged in pictures this was not me so so it, it started to get better and better and especially if you have no choice so when the police will use facial recognition we have no choice so we need to make sure that this this technology is accurate and this we also we need to take into account when defining the risk. So how good is the solution? And what if it goes wrong? So what the what if the police detect someone who is basically not the person they think it is? So it's incorrect data. And to use correct data is also part of the GDPR requirements. It's also a principle of the GDPR. And we need to take that all into account. And um, and I would say the most important thing, because I, I saw it a lot going wrong, is to determine the, law, um, the, the, the lawful basis. So is, is it, do they have a free choice? Like I had a client who implemented iris scan um, when entering an oil platform. Is this okay? Is it not okay? You need to, it, it's a, so what are the interests? In the end, so we evaluated, okay, it's a huge interest. For example, an oil platform is quite, it's quite dangerous to work there. So there could be an explosion. And if we have this IRS scan, we know for 100% this person entered. And this person might also, something might have happened to this person. Um, and, and we felt, okay, this is quite important. And uh, so, but we let the employees decide if they would like to just badge in or if they would like to use their iris scan. And it always depends, it's always an aspect of the different kind of interest. What is important, it's, it's not possible to use legitimate interest when it comes to Article 9 data, to the special categories of data. Okay. I'm gonna, <laughs> thank you. I'm going to stop you there because uh, <laughs> I just want to give uh, Joanna a chance to come in on that because I think you're absolutely right. And Joanna, I mean, um, you know, just to, just just to talk to what you two were saying there. When I was at the Bank of England, we introduced um, uh, hand 
uh, biometric recognition um, and we had to get explicit consent. So, uh, and, and not everybody wanted to sign up to use that. So we had to have alternative mechanisms. And I wondered, uh, Yuta, I'll come back to you, but I, um, I'm curious to know whether that, that oil platform, you know, under health and safety, they could have insisted, you know, under a different lawful basis um, to, to make sure they had the iris scanner because, you know, they need to count people in and count people off, you know, under health and safety. But that's not the question. <laughs> it's more I'm curious. But um, Joanna, I, I um, obviously uh, our, our guests have um, given some both the sort of technical, uh, well, explosion, what we're seeing of, of capabilities here. Um, what about the legal implications? I know that uh, you to there is, has, has started to touch on them, um, but what, what, as lawyers, what, what do we need to consider? You know, all this data has been sucked in and, 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 and you know, I, I just don't know where it's all going and, and what do I need to be thinking about as a lawyer? What, what's your thoughts on this from a sort of legal implications? Um, I, hopefully I will uh, build up on what um, Jutta mentioned already. Uh, but first of all, I think it's important to, to mention the reason why we use digital surveillance technology in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, from my experience working at the local authority, uh, we do contract with various companies that provide digital surveillance technology. Uh, and it is being used on a daily, daily basis at Redbridge and um, all other local authorities. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's important to remember the, you know, the, the positives of, of the technology. Uh, so one good reason for using it, for example, is the ease of enforcement um, of, okay. say, um, highways, traffic, parking, littering offences. Okay. Uh, and yeah. there, are so, there are several other reasons that public institutions use digital surveillance technology. Um, law enforcement agencies use it um, to find missing people. Airports use it for safety and security purposes. Uh, banks use it for uh, prevention of fraud. And with the uh, facial recognition software, uh, being able to improve medical treatment uh, by detecting genetic disorders and um, well, it could prove to be faster and cheaper than traditional testing. Um, yeah. However, uh, all, as all technology, digital surveillance um, has potential benefits as well as drawbacks, depending on how we use it. And in my view, the biggest uh, drawback is the threat it poses to the individual right to privacy, uh, both under the Human Rights Act 1999 and as well as um, to data subjects rights under the data protection legislation, uh, the GDPR and the Data Protection Act 2018. Mm -hmm. um, and it creates potential for uh, data breaches, data theft and other crimes. Um, so I would say when considering the use of digital surveillance, especially in, in light of the current um, COVID-19 pandemic, mm -hmm. we have to ask ourselves uh, three questions. <laughs> So question number one is, is there sufficient balance between privacy and security? Uh, COVID-19 digital surveillance techniques are, we know they're not new, but the purpose for which they are being used is quite new. Governments um, around the world are able to use, um, are able to track the movements of individuals mm -hmm. uh, via their mobile phones uh, with great accuracy and on, this, on a scale not possible in the past. Yeah, and yeah. This, this has been very successful in reducing the number of COVID-19 cases, protecting people's health and saving lives. Um, but the challenge here is for individuals not having to trade off personal privacy for the wider health and economic benefits. Um, the risk is uh, that we may fail to apply sufficient levels of diligence and information risk management to these, um, say, tracing apps. Uh, and also access to large amounts of data, including sensitive medical data that is being collected. Mm -hmm. um, th this is not going to disappear um, once the pandemic is over and it may be expanded and it may be used for other purposes in future and it, it may become the new norm. Yeah. Um, and this is why um, we have to ensure that the steps we take are necessary uh, well governed and time conscious and we have to make sure the practices we follow and systems we build now 
that that they become a lasting feature rather than an emergency measure. That leads me to the second question is, which is, um, do we have sufficient security measures in place? And of course, they are concerned with the large amounts of data um, that is being transferred between organizations on a daily basis um, as to the security of it. And there are different methods that we can use um, to, to, to help that. And I think Jutan actually mentioned that already. Um, and so that leads me to the, the third question, which is, uh, are we compliant with the uh, with the relevant leg uh, legal requirements? And I, I do think we have um, sufficient uh, data legislation, data protection legislation that covers those uh, threats uh, posed by the technology, especially in the in the UK and the EU. Um, but we know it can prove very difficult to ensure full compliance in terms of emergency. And going back to basics in here is, I think, very important. From my experience, um, it's easy to overlook the basic principles of the data protection as set out in the GDPR. And it's so important here because we do want to see uh, transparency to the as to the purpose of um, data collection and, and as to how long it's going to be stored for. And very often these uh, details are not being disclosed um, by some of the tracing apps that we currently use. Uh, and um, the other point is that I often, often see uh, new projects or contracts that involve complex um, processing of personal data uh, with no or insufficient clauses covering these or no privacy impact assessments being completed. And I think that this can be um, well, ma the majority of breaches are caused by, well, um, ignoring People. those, yeah, those basic <laughs> yeah. principles. Yeah. So they could be easily avoided just by following those basic principles and uh, completing DPIAs. So I think it's very important to ensure compliance from the outset. It's brilliant. Do you know what, um, Joanna, that was fantastic and um, very uh, methodical. And what's really lovely about that is you're naturally doing this as part of your um, legal and privacy role at, at that local authority here in the UK. So thank you for that, for being so clear. Um, we've got loads of questions coming through. And um, but before before I do, um, I just wanted to ask this kind of question really for, for, for any one of you, but perhaps Raina, you can start with this. Um, can, can I ask, what, what does the panel feel? And, and there are loads of really good questions, so keep them coming, please. Um, uh, what does the panel feel about the role of accountability or governance and ethics? And, and, and I know that next week, by the way, audience, we've got two guests just talking about, you know, the 40 minutes about ethics. But, what, you know, just that role about accountability, what does, uh, Raina, what do you think? How important is that, um, especially given some of the things we've heard about so far? I think it's the most important. And uh, the reason is uh, what had been said before, we have technology that is getting more powerful every day from a capacity and capability perspective. And we can make impact assessments today. We can uh, design systems today and those systems are capable to modify themselves from an algorithm perspective in their process of, of self-learning um, that makes it very difficult to predict for someone analyzing a risk today what the system will be like tomorrow. And therefore, we need to have uh, ethical uh, standards that are easy to be understood, that even the people maintaining systems can have the chance to find out that their system is potentially running out of the boundaries set initially from, a, from an ethics perspective. So I think ethics is the most important guideline to, to guide the development forward in this specific area. Yeah, and, and you know, thank you. Yuta, what, what's your thoughts on this? So from a legal perspective, it's really important to understand that the controller is accountable. 
So, but always watch out. This, this I saw in the past uh, working in consulting a lot of con uh, processors, which mm -hmm. actually joint controllers. So uh, be aware. So if you have a super complex technology and especially the uh, engineering part is not on your side, so you're just like the controller. You gave the the task to a third party and. Sometimes this is running out of your control. So this happens. So be sure you have a contract, you give the guidance on what they're doing and make sure there's no further processing activities. So um, when it comes to the ethics, for me, it makes a big difference if I have the choice or if I do not have the choice. So for example, if there is, as I mentioned before, uh, facial recognition by the police. If I do not have the choice, it, it's a if it, it's a different kind of deal than like um, assessing for yourself the, the data processing activity or, or understanding it or even having a look at it and then deciding, OK, I would like to use it. So, so I feel this is from an ethical perspective. So do they force someone to be part of it, to be a data subject and also, another part of the ethical uh, perspective is does the controller understand what they are doing with this mm -hmm. technology? So, especially that those super, super um, yeah, facial recognition and all the other new technologies, sometimes they are so complex. I've seen a lot of controllers, they do not understand what their technology can do and what the technology basically does. And, and and that happened and then in, in the same time they do not understand the risks for the data subject and that leads to an insufficient data privacy policy because you can't be transparent if you do not understand the risk if you do not understand the processing activity and also the last part from my side is um, what does the data subject expect so this is a big part I mean you can have like the best data uh, privacy policy and but if you are too legal like your wording is too legal and the data subject mm -hmm. doesn't understand but the data subject feels like uh, from past experience okay this could work like this and in the end it makes a whole different thing than the data sub subject expects this this is uh, failed mm -hmm. regarding the transparency aspect <laughs> thank you thank you so much i'm so sorry because I'd, I'd love to, you know you're, you're making such sense as i as as i knew it would this is a big debate right and um joanna I've, I've got a slightly different one just to kind of point of view and put you on the spot here which has come through early on in the questions that are coming through from our audience and and i'm kind of curious about this because you're in public sector but do you think is there more concern about the this use of technology in the private sector or in the public sector or what, what's your what's your thoughts on that joanna uh, well it depends i think it's uh, it's probably uh, equal because you know we we do have uh, the same sets of well general uh, rules and guidelines and uh, and it's uh, when it comes to you know it actually involves the privacy of individuals and we all have to be concerned with 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 the same sort of uh, issues mm. and um <clears throat> i'm gonna i'm gonna sort of i mean i had loads of questions myself prepared but the but the audience have done a great job for me <laughs> and <clears throat> i i noticed one of the first one uh, george you 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 you're quite prolific here you, you've got loads of questions but they're good What's the impact of facial masks um, in privacy, particular with the designs? And uh, can it can it fall foul of the AI facial tech? So, um, who wants to have a go at that one? <clears throat> um, Is that Raina? <laughs> it's making it's making the job a bit more difficult, but uh, the systems are becoming better and better, and the system has even. Uh, quite a high uh, percentage of accuracy if the system can just see the, the eyes. I mean, if you wear a facial mask and uh, glasses, sunglasses and a hat, then it's becoming a bit more difficult. But yeah. we have to see that some of the systems today already incorporate uh, the body movement into the picture. So 
so it's not only the mapping of the face. Uh, most advanced systems uh, go for a uh, moving image. They look at your uh, movements and they, if they have enough uh, comparative data, they can even identify you on the way you, you move. Wow. Okay. So that answers the question for Nigel. Thank you. <laughs> you inadvertently. <laughs> he asked a question about um, would the panel consider gait analysis uh, identification as biometric data or should it be, you know, so the way that we move, the way that, you know, we're sitting and I, I would say definitely. It's it's kind of a of course a more indirect than than a fingerprint, but it's becoming more and more accurate. And uh, I would say it's it's at the end it's biometric data. It will turn out this way. Okay. I've got I've got I've got one. This is sort of um you too, this is I think this is great. Eloise, thank you for this. Um what's the what are the ethical and legal implications of using the algorithmic um, decision making, you know, i.e. machine learning, um, whether manually constructed and reviewed or it's been trained to do that. And and who should be responsible for regulating that? That's a, that's a good question. Yeah. And a tough yeah. one, just for you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's, it's really difficult to regulate it. First, I mean, with the GDPR, it's, it's a quite general approach. So it was on purpose. They did not name any technologies because technology will move on. So that means I think the body of the GDPR would be good to regulate, but we, we will work with more guidances. I think the regulator, so, so the EU, they could give guidances on that. I think it makes no sense to have a new law or to, to, to go with the GDPR and the revision. It makes no sense because five years later, we this would be quite some work and, and five years later it's all or maybe even I mean Rainer you, you probably know it best maybe even half a year later this is all not valid anymore because technology moved on and and there are new approaches even more risks for the data subject or maybe less risk because encryption technology also gets better um, or maybe we can start to anonymize data um, or more anonymized data when it comes to data processing activities, but not those kind of. So facial recognition and anonymized data doesn't work, obviously. Um, yeah, I think the body GDPR is good and we need to have more guidances. Um, and guidances which are actually not written by a lawyer, they should be written by lawyers and engineers. Okay, wow. That's, that's very good, thank you. Um, great, great insight there. Um, so, so Joanna, um, I've got another uh, uh, anonymous one here. Um, please put your names in. I, 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 you know, or unless you you don't like me calling out your name, that's fair enough. How is proportionality tests being carried out when it looks like there are no alternatives to this uh, privacy um, technologies? So, um, you know, in, you, you mentioned about doing the PIA. Um, how, how do you get that proportionality? test in there what's your, what's your thoughts or considerations on that joanna um well i think it's it, it all comes down to you know just striking the right balance between um the different rights different goals that we want to achieve um we always have to uh take into account um like i mentioned before the the basic uh, principles because they're always applicable and uh, well completing the dpis is, is is one thing but um we just have to decide what our main goal is and how we can reach uh, reach it without compromising um, certain individual rights. Yeah, and and I, I mean it's interesting because some of the questions we've got coming through are sometimes statements, but but there was an interesting one from Sandro here. Um, hi, Sandro. Uh, you know, he's wanted to know. Um, to the panel, is it feasible to segment these kind of processing activities into two different purposes, i.e. identification of special category categories of data and authentication, such as biometrics? So that's uh, a good question, Sandro. Um, any thoughts on that panel? Who, who would like to um, try to, Rainer? Yeah, go ahead. I can say something. Um, I mean, 
as an initial idea, I, I would fully agree. However, we, we have to make sure that even if data is used for authentication, that it's not combined or used in a different way later. I, I make a very little example. I had a client, uh, a telecommunication company, um, who identified uh, their clients uh, with uh, uh, voice recognition. And uh, all of a sudden they found out that in their database of these uh, voice samples, they had information about diseases of the clients. So um, almost publicly available samples of uh, diseases appearances in voice forms um, would have made them uh, capable of telling to their clients who has what disease. Of course, they didn't do this, but they found it out in a risk assessment and uh, they were quite frightened. So even if we collect, for example, biometrics or whatever uh, authentication relevant data, um, uh, it's, we have to safeguard it extremely well not to uh, uh, make it coming to wrong hands and being used for, for purposes never intended in the first place. Wow, thank you. That, no, no, it's um, really good. Um, I've, I've got a question here. I, I, I'm going to ask uh, you to, to, to answer this. Um, and, and it might be slightly unfair, but because um, it's about Brexit <laughs> and uh, the use of tech. Well, it's kind of shrems and, you know, adequacy and, uh, you know, it's all connected. Um, I'm trying to, you know, blend in about three different questions here. Thank you, David and Anonymous um, for these questions. Um, so the first part of this was um, how does the surveillance technology uh, affect the likelihood of an adequacy, adequacy decision for the UK, which obviously you're not going to be able to answer that, but you might have a point of view. And then David goes on to say, do you think the recent Schrems 2 will have an impact on this type of data, especially if we think about some of that processing activities that are maybe being carried out by specialist firms or third parties outside the EEA? Yes, I think it has an impact. I mean, we're, we are talking about those Article 9 data, as we have already mentioned before. And so we need, when processing those special categories of data, we need to have appropriate technical and organizatorial measures. So one of the technical and organizatorial measures, of course, is the governance. So, and in the governance part, you have like the, the data, the transfer to other countries. So for example, if I have a third party, for example, a engineer, who has to process or if, if, okay, I'm the controller and I'm asking another company to create kind of a code, the technology behind my solution I would like to, to um, put in place. And so I need to transfer the data to the US. It's, it's super difficult now because we don't have the adequacy decision for the US and I am quite convinced that we will not have it in the future. Um, and I'm quite convinced we will not have a privacy shield number three. So, uh, but this is only my personal uh, perspective. Um, That's great. <laughs> and so we need to have safeguards in place to transfer the data in, in, a, in a legal manner. And this gets quite difficult yeah. because we need to make sure that the third party, for example, in the US has the right technical and organizatorial measures on a, a GDPR standard. So this is important. So they need to have a privacy standard like we have in the EU. And this is going to be quite difficult on such a high standard. And you need to, first of all, you need to assess your third party in the US or anywhere else. I mean, there are mm -hmm. more countries than only the US, which does not have the adequacy decision in place. And um, yeah, make sure you have a good contract. I think uh, Joanna could talk about this contract, contractual um, aspect. Um, yeah, and, and Joanna, I, I'm just going to add to it because um, uh, uh, George and Boris have asked some questions that are sort of related 
Um, thank you, George, for all your questions. <laughs> it feels like you were saving them up for this episode. So <laughs> there's a lot of them, but they're great. And if we can't answer them, by the way, we do try and answer them out outside of um, this. <laughs> We've only got a few minutes remaining, sadly. Um, so, uh, Nathan, stop doing what you're doing because I've now just lost the questions. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, it was to do with, I can't find it now, but it was to do with the proper regulation of, um, this is another George one and, um, and others, biometric data, especially sort of related to that question or that point that you two was making there about the five eyes, you know, the trusted relationship that we have for terrorism and that, you know, and, and those kind of good fraud prevention techniques, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, will, will, um, Will this help in terms of an adequacy decision? I don't want to make this about Brexit or about uh, Schrems, but um, these questions are coming through thick and fast around that. So I just want to, and then I'll, I'll, I'll then move on to the final set of questions, which was much more around kind of what advice and tips would you give our audience, you know, if you if you were being faced with this. So just to prep you. So Joanna, do you want to give any thoughts to um, to that point? Um, uh, I think that, uh, we, well, these um, types of data, they, we have to remember there are the, uh, different types of data. They should be um, separated uh, as, as they are. But the, 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 the problem is that, um, as we said, technology uh, develops so quickly. And uh, with all those, uh, uh, well, processes that we have in place already, uh, we have the division, uh, of course, between the uh, European Union and then um, global sort of issues as well. And uh, as the, the, the technology develops, I think it's important to actually have um, some sort of uh, harmonized um, set of rules uh, between well, the, U the EU, UK and uh, other countries around the world. Uh, so I think that's um, something that um, we should be considering and there, there, there has been already um, uh, some guidance provided um, on this uh, by the um, United Nations. Um, okay, right. So, so I think that's quite useful. I mean, you, we, we, all ha we all have, um, you know, our worries and our, um, like I said, uh, process processes in place. Uh, but uh, just considering um, just a sort of like general um, risk management tool, um, considering uh, fundament fundamental human rights um, and also um, recognizing the social value of data in general, uh, this should really be used um, in creating a framework for, for overall accountable um, transparent and uh, responsible um, data handling uh, practices across across the globe. Yep. Thank you. And look, uh, sadly, as usual, we've run out of time. Um, the, 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 this is always a challenge. We have such fantastic uh, audience participation. So thank you for your question. And I really am genuinely sorry that we couldn't get to answer all of those. Um, what I would like to just ask the panel, I'll, st I'll start with yourself, Raina. Um, you, you, you've given us a, a very good technical insight into this and the capabilities are well, endless. Um, what, what would you, what would be your top tips if you were advising a client um, tomorrow or, or perhaps Monday <laughs> um, on on what to do when it comes to the use or the deployment of such technology. What would be the like the burning kind of tips that you'd like to give? And I'll, I'll ask the same question to to both Uta and uh, Joanna. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the tip would be that uh, the client should uh, try to stay on top of the kind of semi-autonomous development of the environment of the client's uh, technology. Mm -hmm. We have uh, today black box technology that is even designed in a way that you cannot understand how it's working and still you are accountable for it. So at least uh, try to kind of ensure that the systems are fulfilling the purposes they are built for 
and not more. Wonderful. Wow, that was very concise. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, uh, you talk, do, you, do you want to uh, give us your thoughts? Um, what, what advice would you would you give your colleagues? Sure. Um, my advice is uh, understand the data, the complexity of your data processing activity. For example, understand that an algorithm, if you design it that way, it learns from your old behavior. For example, if you're trying to to make your your uh, HR more or to your onboarding and, and your hiring system more diverse, don't let it, don't put the algorithm on your old data. So don't let the algorithm learn from your old data because then it's just like going the same way and it will hire. It, that happened in the past with a big tech provider, not Google. And, <laughs> and be transparent. Be transparent in every single step and yeah, but this comes together with the understanding of the complexity. You can only be transparent if you understand the complexity. Thank you. That That is wonderful. And um, finally, Joanna, what, what uh, top tips? Yes, I, I, I'm not going to be very original. I'm going to ask, uh, add to what uh, you just said. Uh, as a, uh, a prevention um, strategy, I would say invest in um, ongoing learning and training uh, for uh, all employees um, and also ensure that your um, policies, um, internal and external, are always up to date. Um, I think that um, well, the informed and up-to-date uh, workplace uh, creates natural enhanced protection against any um, cyber security threats. Wonderful. Look, I'm, I'm so sorry because sadly we've once again run out here, uh, of time here at Data Matters and we never even got the opportunity to ask Raymond to explain why he has a laser in his back, you know, drop. Um, but um, look, without further ado, I need to thank you all terribly. Um, you know, for, here at Privacy Culture, we take a great deal of pride in bringing um, very realistic, very real uh, guests that are, that are on the front line. And so each of you have demonstrated your infinite wisdom and knowledge on this subject. And I'm really pleased that we could share that with our audiences today. Um, so a big thank you for, from us at the team. Big thanks to our audience as usual. Um, without you, uh, please, it, it's not going to work, right? So please give us your feedback. Tell us what we can do more or less of. Uh, I know time is always tight on this weekly show and, you know, my producer is already kicking me under the virtual table to get <laughs> off. Um, uh, so um, tune in next week for our sadly the last in the series for this year anyway of uh, Data Matters. Um, next week I have the pleasure of having the um, CPO for Refinitiv, Vivian Arts and uh, the director at the Centre for Information Policy Leadership, uh, Natalie Laronne, um, both of which uh, we are going to be talking about data ethics. And we're going to unpick that and bring that to life for you and give you some practical tips as always. So thanks very much for listening to Data Matters this week. Um, I look forward to seeing you again this time next week. Bye for now.